Hey, do me a favor, turn in your Bibles to John chapter six. You can bring those lights up for me. John chapter six, I'll meet you there in just a minute, said the preacher. Um, but I wanna open this week with the statement that I closed with last week because I believe that this is a foundational perspective of God's word. Here's what we said in this series we've called, Help Me, Jesus. See, it's just not impactful when you say it that way. We call it, Help Me, Jesus. That's what we've called, called this series. And last week, we ended with a statement. We're gonna pray like God can do anything. And I'm gonna come back to that. This is where we're gonna hang our hat today. But we're gonna live for him no matter what he does. Do, is it frozen? Is it being silly? We're gonna live for him no matter what he does. And, and here's why I brought this statement back up. And I wanna leave it up there. I believe that this statement, and, and, and I've had to, I have a dissertation on this, okay? I've had to flesh and faith my way through the balance of this statement. But I believe that this statement is the balance between believing God for the miraculous, which we're supposed to do, we just sang about, okay? And then this very superficial faith, self-focused prosperity gospel where God is supposed to be like a genie in the Bible that answers our every request, and if he doesn't, it's because we didn't have enough faith. Okay, that's bad doctrine. But so is not believing God for miraculous signs and wonders because he's God. Okay, so I've been to, I, growing up in North Louisiana and up into Arkansas and then traveling, I was down in Florida and up in New York. Like, I've been to every kind of service imaginable. I, almost every one, from people wearing veils to people wearing spiritual masks. It. Okay, and, and I've, been, I've been in the services that were obviously a drawn up attempt at emotionalism, and I felt like the Holy Spirit was sitting in the corner doing this. And the people that didn't go to church there every week left with the Holy Spirit. You know what I'm saying? Like it was weird, it was out of order, it was not just uncomfortable, it was unbiblical. And it's one of those, you, you just gotta have enough faith. If you got enough faith, you can speak to things that are not as though they were, and you can get that miracle. If you just have enough faith, you can see that provision. If you just, and some of that is biblical. The problem comes in when you make it focused on yourself. And it becomes this give to get mentality where if you don't have people spinning, spitting, falling on the floor and being slain, you don't think you had church. The problem is you gotta wake up Monday morning and I'm not gonna provide the worship service for you. So when you wake up tomorrow and you don't feel all that excess emotionalism, and I'm not against emotion, I believe a move of God will include some emotion from his people. I'm against emotionalism, I'm against sensationalism, I'm against pseudo-spiritualism that's not authentic. But then I've also, now some, I'm making some of y'all mad, just hang on, I'm gonna come back to you. Because over here are the services that constrict the move of God. And they don't believe for the miraculous anymore because God doesn't move that way anymore. That's not what I believe, that's what I've been to services where they're not willing to obey God outside of their own comfort zone. And because their weak leadership doesn't know how to handle things that get out of order and be willing to step in and bring them back in line with a biblical standard, they constrict the things that they're not comfortable with and they're not comfortable with them because they're not familiar with them. But when you read your Bible, God did all kinds of things that were unfamiliar and uncomfortable. Ooh, I'm feeling this one. I had the message in first service. I think it's got me in this service. We've gotta believe God beyond where we are. That's praying like God can do anything. I've, I'm not for the, the drawn up, it's only the Holy Ghost if it feels a certain way service. And at the same time, I'm not willing to constrict this thing down to a comfort zone that allows people to sit comfortably in seats but not share their faith on a daily basis. I want, I want what God has. I want, I want what he has. My notes from last week 
help, uh, we actually ended in John chapter six, but I only got to it online. In John chapter six, I'll let you go back and read that on your own, as many of you will do this afternoon all by yourself. I know it in faith. See, that's speaking to things that are not as though they were. Um, John chapter six, in, in the beginning of John chapter six, Jesus is recorded to have performed this miracle of feeding 5,000 men along with the women and children of those men. And in this story, I won't preach that today, but in this story, um, two fish and five loaves of bread equals 15,000 meals. See, to me, two plus five equals seven, but to God, two plus five equals 15,000. What does that mean? If you'll just bring God what you have, ooh, I'll over preach it if I'm not careful. If you'll just bring God what you have, he will multiply it into souls for the sake of his kingdom that you beyond your own ability to imagine. That's who he is, it's what he does. And so he, he feeds the 5,000 and then, and then later on down in verse 16, he walks on water what most people would drown in, what most people would be overcome by. See, Jesus doesn't need to get to the other side of the storm in order to have authority over it. Woo he, he can walk on the water of the storm. He can calm the sea or he can let it rain. It doesn't matter to him because he created all things and in him all things were created. So he walks on water showing that he has dominion over nature itself. And then he begins to prophesy to these people and he says crazy stuff like, no, I am the bread of life. Why did he say that because they were hungry again. These were the same people that just ate. And Jesus was not enabling spiritual obesity. Whew, I better be careful today. I'm going to step in something. He, Jesus was not willing to just feed the same people in the same way because that's what they wanted. When they asked him to perform the same miracle that he just performed, instead of giving them more bread, he said, I need you to understand something today. I'm not just providing bread. I am the bread. I'm not just giving provision. I am the provision. I don't just heal. I I am the healer. You understand what I'm saying? So Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And they didn't like that answer. So Jesus told them this real compassionate. Like he said, stop complaining. Did, and I, did, this was not in my notes. I believe this is spirit filled. If not, then just cast it off of you. But I believe that complaining is confessing the devil's agenda into your atmosphere. Because the Bible compares complaining to blasphemy, idolatry, and immorality in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So complaining is, you're going to catch yourself this week too, because I catch myself all the time, because I, 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 like I like to vent. It's just, it's, it just feels better when it comes out. Well, some things just need to stay in. You know what I'm saying? Let me give you a sign that it needs to stay in. You know, I probably shouldn't say this. Listen to that still small voice. Come on, somebody. If you got to lead with that, you're right. Don't do it. All right, so complaining, truly, complaining is confessing the agenda of the enemy into the atmosphere in which God may have actually put you. So instead of confessing the enemy's agenda, how about we confess God's assignment? And Jesus said, stop complaining. In other words, I'm not going to listen to that mess. He said, here's your job. You want to know what God wants you to do? It's found in John chapter six. This is the will of God for you. I can help you for the rest of your life. Jesus told those people, this is what God wants you to work on. Believe in the one whom he has sent. That's your responsibility. Everything else is up to me. Believe in the one whom he has sent. And then Jesus starts talking weird. And he says, if you're going to eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. Now, I'm going to say without apology, as the lead pastor of this church with a master's degree in theology, I don't have my doctorate yet, but one day, Lord help me. Um, but in, in my interpretation and that of the ordination from the assemblies of God that protects the doctrine that I believe in, based on those confessions, this chapter of Jesus's confession has nothing to do, absolutely nothing. They're not receiving communion. He already performed the, the miracle of the bread and the fish, and he just told them, I am the bread of life. This has nothing to do with eating bread that turns into flesh. 
and it has nothing to do with consuming alcohol that turns into blood. That's why at this church, we just have a little wafer and we just have a little cup of grape juice. The reason that we don't have alcoholic wine is because I've got some people who used to be alcoholics, but now they're anointed and I don't wanna remind them of what they've been delivered from. I want them to remember who they are. Why? Because at this church, we don't just receive the sacraments. We are the sacraments. God has called us to be the bread of life. He's called us to be the living water. He's called us to be covered in the blood. Why? Because it's by the blood of the lamb and the word of my testimony that I have overcome. And if you will catch what he has put in me, then you can overcome too. This passage has to do with laying your life down on behalf of the Savior. Ooh, I got a little more into it than I meant to. John chapter 6, <laughs> verse 66. That's John 666. 6, 6. I believe it's as demonic and frightening of a verse as there is in Scripture, and I don't think it's an accident that even though we added the numbers later, it happened to land on that number. The Bible says, after this, when Jesus said something they didn't want to hear, there was a church on every corner. They didn't have to stay. And Jesus responded in a way that they didn't like. And many of his disciples, did you know that you could be a disciple and turn back? I didn't say it. John said it. I'm just showing it to you. Many of his disciples turned back. And over the last decade and a half of my tenure in ministry, I have seen this scripture take place over and over again. People that were on fire for God or people that didn't even feel the fire, but just had the faith enough to walk with him and follow him step by step. For whatever reason in their journey, they decided to turn back and no longer walk with him. And so Jesus turns and he looks at the faithful few still standing there. And he says, will you also leave? That's my question today. Will you also leave? Whenever he says something that you didn't want to hear, whenever he doesn't do what you wanted him to do, will you also leave whenever it doesn't work out the way that you wanted it to? Or the preacher or the person preaching says something that you didn't want to hear. Will you also leave? And I love Simon Peter's response to King Jesus. He looks at him and he says, to whom would we go? Like, what other system of faith is there that has a Messiah like you? Where would we go? What would we do? Listen, I want you to be so ingrained in your relationship with God that you get to a place that you don't have any other option but to do what he's called you to do, to pray the way he's called you, to live the way that he's called you to live, that the things that you used to be okay with are now revolting to your soul because you're so ingrained in what To, to who, where are we going to go? God, if this don't work out, <laughs> like I don't have a plan B. You're the plan. Peter responds in verse 69 of John chapter 6. Here's what he says. He says, you know what? Um, we have believed in you. And we have, and this is what we've been talking about for the past two weeks. We have come to know. And that's twofold. Like, I have physically come because I want to know. But I have also, over the time that I have spent with you, not just the decision that I made to follow you, but the days that I have walked with you as a disciple. Are you with me? I have come to know what? That you are the Holy One of God. There's not another holy one. There's not another path. There's not another person. It's either your way or no way. So I'm with you. And they stayed. And uh, I, I wanted to give you an example today of what it means to, to, for both of those to know, to know Jesus. Because last week we talked about sharing in his suffering. And this week I want to take us back to a place where we pray like God can do anything. If you miss sharing his suffering, please go watch that because that's the balance of this message today.
But how many of you have ever heard the name Mordecai Ham? You know who Mordecai Ham is. Just wave at me. If you were in first service, don't cheat. Just wave. More to a couple of people. A couple of people know who. I have a picture of Mordecai Ham. This is from the late 1800s. This is Mordecai Ham. Mordecai Ham was a salesman that did not want to preach the gospel. He wanted to make money through sales, which there's nothing wrong with unless God has called you to sell that business and go into evangelism. So he was pulling on the heart of Mordecai him in the late 1800s. And you can see that Mordecai decided to go and preach the gospel. Um, it's a street preacher. Like the, it's the, he doesn't have signs and he doesn't say God hates people and all that stupid stuff. He's just preaching the gospel. He's sharing his faith. He's telling his story. And you can see the huge crowd there. There's this one blue collar worker looking out the window. I'm um, thinking, why is this van in the way? Uh, I wonder what's going on out there. Not a ton of people there. In fact, it's, uh, his slogan is, hear ham. That's powerful. I don't know if that hit you the way that it did me, but if we advertise, hey, hear ham tonight at eight o'clock, I don't know how big of a crowd we're gonna draw. That's not really the most potent proclamation that we could have made. But that was his slogan. And, and I don't think he preached to a lot of people. There weren't a lot of large crowds, but there was one little boy there who heard the gospel and saw Mordecai Ham and something stirred on the inside of him that he wanted to not just know Jesus, but obey God the way that Mordecai Ham did. And that little boy's name was Billy Graham. Billy Graham passed away a couple of years ago, uh, 90 plus years old, and he has led millions of people in the faith. He has led millions of people, and the ministry that he launched is still ministering in an even greater capacity now that he has gone to be with the Lord than it did when he was actually here on earth leading it. And you could trace the lineage and the legacy of Billy and Franklin Graham back to one man. Y'all not hearing what I'm preaching right now. Back to one man's obedience who prayed like God could do anything because he had come to know, he had come to know Jesus. I want to do like a quick illustration. Um, how many of you know, you know, Chipper Jones? You know, cool. Oh, that was way more than first service. Thank you, Lord. Some, some people who know a switch hitting hall of fame baseball player that led third base and won a couple of world series. Um, I don't know where, uh, and then I, how many of you know, Drew Brees? Let's try that one here. And Oh, look, uh, <laughs> Drew Brees. How look, let's go this one. How many of you know, cause some people still haven't raised their hand. How many people know Taylor Swift? Raise your hand. How many of you listen to her new album? We pray for you in the name of Jesus. If I She's not a Christian, by the way, because you'll know them by their fruit. I'm just saying, I ain't got time for that today, and I don't want to argue with you, and if you want to argue that, then you and I just have different interpretations of the Bible, and we'll just keep growing closer to God together. But Taylor Swift, people know Taylor Swift, and people know Drew Brees, and people know Chipper Jones. So here's my question. Um, does anybody know where Taylor Swift lives? You might not want to answer out loud because I might get you. It's just kind of more rhetorical. Do you, if you know, do you know her address? Don't Google it. Just write, write just, do you know her address. Cause you said, people said, I know Taylor Swift. Um, so if you know her, you know, her address, you know where she lives. And, and you could, if you, if you showed up at her house, um, tomorrow, cause you'd have to fly there. But if you showed up at her house and knocked on her door, would she let you in? Because you know her, but you said, you know her. And I just described for you most of South Louisiana's relationship with Jesus. Most Bible Belt believers' relationship with God. Do you know Jesus? Well, yes, I know Jesus. Yeah, but if you showed up at his house, would he let you in? Because you have given him your life. You have walked in fellowship with him. And when you show up at the gates, he says, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of my kingdom. Or would it be like showing up at Drew Brees' house this afternoon and you knock on the door and he says what Jesus quoted in Matthew chapter seven, depart from me. I, I never knew you. I gave you a lot of opportunities to come to know me, but you didn't let me reveal myself. You were a disciple at times, but for whatever reason you turned, you turned away. So here's what I wanna ask of you today. Woo, that went by quick. Um, but I wanna ask of you today is that just for a moment, 
you would put your past in the proper place, which is under the blood of Jesus. The only thing that you can get from your past is forgiveness and lessons learned. You with me? That's the only thing the past is good for. So what I want you to do is I want you to take your past experience and I want you to just, just set it to the side today because most people allow their past to affect their present. The perspective that people have in this moment is based on moments that they had in the past. And so for the rest of this message, I'm gonna ask you, excuse me, to go back to a place where we believe more about this book than we do what we have experienced in the past because most people base what they believe about the word of God and the ability of the Almighty is based on what he has or has not done for them or through them thus far. And what I'm asking today is that you do not allow your past to affect your perspective of his Presence. What I want today is that you would cause your experience to line up with his word and stop trying to make his, are you with me? Stop trying to make his word line up with your experience. I want to go back to the place. Why? It's hard for us to believe what God wants to do this time when we stay focused on what he did or did not do last time. You're not in a last time season. You're in a this time season. What God did before may not want to be, may not be what he wants to do through the next door. God wants to take you where you are. Vision is the distance between where you are and where God wants to take you. So instead of being focused on what you have done or what you haven't done or what God hasn't done, let's just be where we are and believe God, the one who created all things and is the same yesterday, today, and forever as if he is still the God of impossibilities. That's what I'm, I'm asking you to just set it aside is all. But if I said it that way, then you wouldn't have understood what I said. And I want you to pray like God can do anything. And last week I said, live for him no matter what. But then this week, what I want you to do is I want you to obey when it doesn't make sense. Because that was what caused the disciples to turn away and go back to the things that they had been delivered from. I, I want you to learn how to obey when it doesn't make sense sense. Why? Because at 39 years old, and I'm holding on to it, I'm holding on to my 30s. The only person in the room holding on to their 30s harder than me is that little five foot two inch blind right there who's shaking her head no at me. Because we just got like one more month that we're hanging on to 39, and then we'll be 40, and then 41 forever. Come on, somebody. You just, <laughs> 41, it's a store. It's where they sell yoga pants. Just yoga pants. 41 forever. I, <laughs> we're we're 39, we're 39 years old. And at 39 years old, I desperately want people to start believing and believe again. I stand in the gap, as you've heard me say and preach before, between the miracles that were and the miracles that are about to be. And I don't believe that this generation has the opportunity to be affected by my past perspective when God wants to do a new thing right now in this gen at this time. So, and, and so I, I desperately, like, I hear me. Why do we preach on giving? Why do we preach on tithing? Why are we talking about worshiping God with our giving? Why do we pray that you would learn how to fully surrender your time, talent, and treasure? Because I want you to walk through the seasons that we've walked through. I want you to learn how to give yourself into a position that you have to believe more in God's provision than your ability. Y'all not hearing me. I want you to learn how to worship God with an offering that costs you something so that when you get to the other side of what you gave and you are walking in more than what you had, you know that it wasn't because you're hard working or 
where you're better than anybody else. I want you to learn how to make a faith promise to God and give money that you don't have so that you will see provision that you have never seen before. So that when you're walking, not in the last season, but in the next season, that you get to a place where you go, God, there's not anything that you can't ask of me because you provided in the previous season and I'm walking in that provision. So what do you want to do now? I trust you, even though it doesn't make sense. I want you to learn how to worship God with your time. I'm not, we're not receiving any offerings today. We're, I just want to develop a heart of generosity inside of you. I want to develop and, 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 and train a church full of people that are interruptible and approachable. Can I get some help from the angry Cajun face? No help. That's cool. I'll keep preaching. I want, I'm not asking you to quit your job and come volunteer at the church. That's not what this is about. But man, I want you to get connected in 2024. Man, I want you to learn how to serve. And I want you to learn how to show up consistently and prioritize the presence of God and the ministry of God. Because there are dreams and ministries and desires inside of you that are birthed and conceived and incubating that the only way, God help me, the only way we will see them come to pass if you, is if you will begin to pray to the God of all things like he can do anything and obey him even when it doesn't make sense. I'm not asking you to walk around and live in denial I'm not asking you to have blind faith. It's only blind at first. Come on, but when you walk by faith and not by sight, then you begin to trust God more than you do what you can see. Come on, can you hear me today? I'm talking about going into uncharted territory this morning. I'm talking about watching God do things that you don't even read about in this book because he's so good that his mercies are made in a way today that they weren't even prepared to be made for them. My Bible says, no eye has seen, no ear has has heard. If that's the case, then this generation is about to see something and hear something that no other generation has ever seen or heard before. It hasn't even entered into the heart of a generation full of people yet. The things that God has prepared for those who love him, but he has revealed those things to us by his spirit. Why? Because the spirit of the living God searches all things, even the deep things that are divinely imparted for right now. So I'm asking that you would stop looking at your past and fix your eyes upon the author and the perfecter of your faith and let his presence and let his proclamations guide your faith. It's not blind faith. It's faith that is beyond what is happening right now. God, I can't see it. I can't feel it. I don't need emotionalism. I just need obedience. God, I don't need you to do anything else. I just know that whether I'm in the valley or on the mountain, as long as I'm with you, I'm going to get to the other side. <laughs> Last week, I talked about sharing in his suffering. This week, I'm talking about believing God beyond where you are. I'm not talking about making crazy decisions and then blaming God for the way that it worked out. I'm talking about hearing the voice of God. I believe in closing, God help me. In order to see God produce, we need to plow. I don't have, ooh, that hit me. I don't have an Elisha anointing on my life. What does he mean? I don't have a double portion anointing. I have an Elijah anointing. The Elijah anointing is one that will wrestle with God. Elisha was very emotional. He was on the mountain calling fire down from heaven. And then he let one email get the best of him. 
and he ran and hid. And the Bible says that Elijah was in a cave. I want to leave that up there because I'm coming to it. Uh, Elijah was in a cave, and, the, and some of you have heard this. It's, I believe it's in 1 Kings chapter 19. And Elijah was in a cave, and, and he, was, he needed to hear from God. I mean, he just saw God like consume the fire, the, the altar, the, the sacrifice, and lick up the water. And then he overcame like 700 prophets of Baal and Asherah. And now here he is on the other side of that miracle needing another one. I, some of you are like, oh man, I'm like Elijah too. <laughs> and he's in a cave. He's like, God, I need to hear from you. And the Bible says that in the cave there was an earthquake. And everybody's like, Jesus is coming. It's an eclipse. It's an earthquake. It's happening right now. But the Bible says God was not in the earthquake. And then the Bible says there was a great wind. And I'm four because when the Holy Spirit came in, there was a mighty rushing wind and tongues of fire. But God wasn't in that wind. And then the Bible says that there was a fire. Oh, I just need to get back to the place where I got that fire. Come on, somebody. I need the fire. I want the fire. Lord, send the fire. Hang on, hang on. But the Bible says he wasn't in that fire. Because he provided fire on the mountain. And yet Elijah is still in a mess. And then Elijah heard a whisper. See, anybody can hear from God when I'm preaching it. But can you hear from God? when it's just you and him in a cave. Can you hear the whisper despite the earthquake? Come on, I'm trying to help some. Can you hear the whisper despite all the noise? Can you hear the whisper despite all the excess? Because his voice is found in the whisper. And Elijah got up from that cave and he went and found Elisha. And the Bible says this is what Elisha was doing. Just plowing. Living at his mama's house. Plowing his daddy's field. Just getting up and going to work every day. But something supernatural happens when you don't know what to do, but you do what you're supposed to do. And Elijah came around the corner and Elisha saw his future in his present when he was plowing. So I'm asking today that you plow. P-L-O-W. This is how I'll close. Number one, you pray. Plow. Pray. Come on, pray like God can do anything. What is prayer? Prayer is me taking the time to align my spirit with God's spirit. We'll talk more about praying. And I think you need to have scheduled times of prayer and spontaneous times of prayer. Come on, I think it needs to be structured and in the spirit. I don't, oh God, who art thou? No, God bless it. But I'll pray the Our Father. I'll pray it this way. Father in heaven, holy Holy, holy is your name. God, let your kingdom come in my life. God, let your kingdom come in my wife. Let your kingdom come in my children. Let your kingdom come in this church. Let your kingdom come in Acadiana. God, I plead your blood over our state and our nation. Let your kingdom come. That's how I I don't shout in 6 a.m. because my wife would get mad at me for waking her up, but that's how I'm praying. It's personal. And you have this private, personal time with God, and yet at the same time, the Bible says, pray without ceasing, and I wish that you pray in the Spirit at all times. So we pray. Number two, L, guess. Why? Because that's part of prayer. Prayer is not just you telling God what you want. It's you taking the time to listen and hear what he wants, what he has. 
We call it yield. And when we take the time as a family to yield, my children have heard numbers of amounts of offerings that they're supposed to give. I'm teaching God's children what I teach mine. My children have heard acts of obedience that only they could hear because there is coming a point in their relationship with God that they can't just do what we say. They've got to learn how to hear what he says. It's when you listen, you listen. And then the O, it's when you obey. Oh, I like the first part. Let's just plug. No, no, no. Your relationship with God has got to go to the next place where you obey irrationally, where you obey immediately. Why immediately? Because if you wait, you'll talk yourself out of it. <laughs> but if you obey immediately because you heard that voice, then you will learn how to obey that voice over any fear or anxiety that may come along with what you were going through. I obey. Why? Because the miraculous, I'm going to preach this and we're going to pray. The miraculous moves of God, hear me, are tied to the irrational obedience of his people. Take up your mat and walk. I ain't walked in 30 years. Take up your mat and walk. Throw a stick in the water, Elisha. I'm about to make a metal ax head float. Joshua, I know it's flood stage. I know that you could die, but I need you to wade out into the middle of the Jordan River. God, can't you just do the thing that you did with Moses where he put his staff in the water from a safe place on the bank? No, Joshua, I don't want to do for you what I did for him. I want to do a new thing in you. I don't have a miracle that I've already performed for somebody else. I'm about to do something that you ain't never seen before, so I need you to wade out in that water and get to a place where if I don't intervene on your behalf then it ain't gonna happen but when you get there and you come to the other side here's what the W stands for everybody will get to see what I wanted to show them because God is standing in the kingdom going watch this I know you live in South Louisiana I know that you have a poverty mentality I know that you think you live in lack and I know that you think that it ain't big enough and there ain't an economy great enough and there's not enough business and there's not enough effort. But I'm telling you today that God told me when I was praying for this city, when I was praying for this area, I said, God, boost the economy, send in businesses, make the infrastructure grow, expand this thing to support what you've called me to build. And my God said, Chris, I didn't send you to Eunice, Louisiana so that I could build a community to support a church. I sent you to that place to gather enough people that I want to use a remnant of people who will believe me with crazy faith that I'm going to build a church that will support a community. That's what I want to do. That you position yourself. And God says, now watch this. How is he doing it? I don't know. All I know is that what's happening has got to be God. Here's what Dr. Chan says. He says, you've got to position yourself to let God perform miracles through you. That's your, you have one job, to believe in the one whom he has sent. Position yourself. And when you position yourself into a place where you cannot provide and you cannot accomplish what he's told you to do if he does not intervene in a supernatural way, then other people will see it. And other people, when you let God say, watch this, other people will look and go, wow. Look what the, not what Chris Fry has done. No, no, no. Look, look what God did. Not what New Hope did. No, no, no. Look what God did. Believing beyond where you are. Stretching your faith into uncharted. I'm challenging you today, this week, 
Let God take your relationship with him into unfamiliar territory. Pray like he can do anything and obey, especially when it doesn't make sense. Hey, if you just committed your life to Christ, or maybe you recommitted your life to Jesus, listen, we want to celebrate with you and connect with you. The best way that we do that is through a text. Would you text I believe to 84576? It is as simple as that. Again, that's I believe to 84576. We have a team standing by that would love to connect with you. They want to celebrate with you. In fact, we even want to pray with you. All you have to do is go to our website, eunicechurch.com, or you can download our church app, New Hope Eunice. Either way, we have a prayer request tab that you can fill out right there that goes directly to our team and our staff. And we would love to start this journey with you, connecting with you, and celebrating with you. While you're on that, check out all of our events that we have going on here at New Hope. Man, join a small group, sign up for Next Step, and we can promise you this, that this will be your church home and you can find a place here. Before you go, simply open up your hands like I'm handing you a gift, and please let me pray a special blessing over you right now. God, I pray, Lord, for every person watching, that you would bless your people. God, that you would shine your face upon us and be gracious to us. Lord, lift up your countenance upon us and give us your peace. And help us, Holy Spirit, to anoint us and to accomplish the vision that you have given us here at New Hope, and that is to meet people and grow closer to you together. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you again for watching, and stay tuned for anything and everything that we have going on here at New Hope. God bless.